How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth, for the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer to give you the opportunity to use 1 John 1, 9 if necessary. Make sure you're in fellowship, ready to focus on the study of the Word tonight. Let's pray. Lord, it's a great pleasure to come together and study your Word, to be refreshed by the things that we study here, that these eternal truths that you have revealed to us are just as true today as they were a thousand and two thousand and three thousand years ago. They give our lives stability, they teach us hope, and they give us structure and, and function to our lives. We thank you above all for our salvation that's free, undeserved, unmerited, and that Jesus our Lord paid it all. Now, Father, guide and direct us as we study tonight. Challenge us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. After the message on Tuesday night when I talked about the crisis in biblical pastoral leadership, I got a response from a pastor who, <clears throat> I'm not going to mention his name, he said, I listened to your message on the importance of seminary early this morning. I just wanted to take the time to thank you for your challenge. Your challenge over the years has motivated me to continue overcoming the lack of training I received at the seminary he went to, which will remain nameless. Although I took three years of Greek and three years of Hebrew, and the three to four exegetical courses that were required afterwards, it was not the correct methodology. That seminary taught us to exegete within a theological system and not the text itself. Although many of the tools I learned are useful, you have helped me direct them in the proper course of exegetical methodology. I just wanted to say thanks. So that was it's always encouraging when I get uh, notes like that from pastors out there. It's amazing how many people listen to uh, the website. I just have no idea. You, you don't either. We just don't know where all this is, is going and what it's doing. And we're just sitting here in Houston and, and uh, doing our thing and and like so many other churches, the Lord is using this stuff on the Internet. It's like a whole new mission field. And so many, just, we don't know, hundreds, thousands of people listen. I know that in the last year, the amount of downloads off the Internet have tripled since uh, November a year ago. So the Lord just continues to provide. As long as the Lord provides the logistical support for the ministry to continue, then it will. Okay, we're in Hebrews, but we won't be there for long, so let's just orient again. Hebrews 6, 7, and 8 has this illustration about the fruitfulness of the believer. And we have to understand what the Bible means when it talks about the fruitfulness of the believer and why fruitfulness is important. We have to understand what it is and what it isn't, what it is good for and what it's not good for, that God did not call us to be fruit inspectors but to be students of the Word, abiding in Him, so that He could produce fruit in us. So we have this illustration in Hebrews 6, right in the middle of a... Excuse me a minute while I try to get rid of something here, so we don't continuously have problems. Okay. All right. Hebrews 6, 7, and 8 is in the midst of a section dealing with a warning passage against believers who have completely fallen away, are on the verge of completely falling away, and how dangerous that is. And then there's this illustration that the earth drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful to those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. The focus is on two things, fruit production or the production of the plant, and then end results, blessing or 
cursing both in time and in eternity. We've looked at the symbols there and seen that the earth is the believer. The rain represents the provision of God, the Word of God, and the Spirit of God. The herbs represent the production of good fruit or divine good that has uh, eternal quality to it. The thorns and thistles is a production of evil, sin, and human good. And the cultivator is God. God is the one ultimately producing the fruit. It is not ourselves. It's not our own efforts that produce the fruit. We are to be in right relationship with God the Holy Spirit. We're to be walking with the Spirit, abiding in Christ, dependent upon the Word of God, taking in the Word of God, applying the Word of God. And when we're doing that, then it is the Holy Spirit who takes that in an, in an unseen, invisible way, and He produces growth and maturity in us, leading to the production of fruit. So we're going through the passages. Now, these passages, are not only are they all important, because we have to recognize that the Word of God doesn't tell us everything there is to say about any particular topic or subject or doctrine in any one verse. So we take different key passages where some was revealed here, some was revealed there, uh, some more was revealed over here, and we start putting these together to create an, a clear understanding of the entirety of the doctrine. So we move from Hebrews 6, 7 to begin our study in John 15, 1 through 6. And in John 15, we saw that there were three types of branches. There's the non-fruit-bearing branches that were to be lifted up. That's the corrected translation, not cut off, but lifted up. And these represent young believers that are nurtured uh, so that they can produce fruit in coming years as they mature. Then there were the fruit-bearing branches that were pruned for greater fruit production. And this represents discipline in the positive sense of the word, not discipline in the sense of uh, punitive punishment. Uh, that's kind of redundant, isn't it? Repeatedly redundant. It's not punitive discipline. It is productive discipline, teaching us to be disciplined in the Christian life and to do away with that which is not productive. And then the third were the non-abiding branches, which were pruned, completely removed, discarded as useless, which is a picture of divine discipline on the believer uh, in time, uh, even to the extent of sin unto death. We saw, secondly, that the goal in John 15 is fruit production. The believer is to abide. Some six times that word is used to abide. Several times the word fruit is used. That's the goal, fruit production. John 15, 8, by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. And so you will become, that is, in the process, come, becoming something you weren't before, so you will become my disciples. And we saw that there were truly three different uh, stages of fruit production mentioned there. There's the those who bore fruit, those who bore more fruit, and those who bore much fruit. We see the same kind of thing uh, in Matthew chapter 13, which we'll look at a little more this evening, that believers produce fruit in different levels. So the goal is fruit production. Third thing we saw is that the sole and necessary condition for fruit production is abiding in John 15. You have to abide in Christ. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words, there's doctrine. My words abide in you. It's not just a feel-good thing. It's not just a subjective or psychological thing. It's based upon the word of God, uh, apprehended, studied, understood. You can't believe what you don't understand. You can't understand what you haven't thought about. That's why the Old Testament talked about meditation all the time. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Furthermore, we learn from this, the fourth point, that this abiding is not some subjective or psychological state, but is related to uh, doctrine in the believer, leading to the fifth point, that abiding is not simply a positional reality or an abstract doctrine. It is manifest in an ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ is indicated through prayer. There is the two-way communication. God speaks to us through His Word. We speak to God in prayer. It is two people, as it were, two persons. God is a person. He has ability to communicate. We are people. We, we are designed for fellowship, for intimacy with God. And the term abide uh, 
emphasizes this intimate, ongoing relationship of the believer. Six, the relationship, as I've said already, isn't based on subjective impressions or on subjective criterion of having a close walk with Jesus or feeling like you're closer to Jesus because you've sung a lot of Christian choruses and everybody had a good time standing up and stomping the feet and clapping their hands and swaying to the music and enjoying the beat. But it is because you follow the clear uh, markers of Scripture to indicate your abiding in Christ. If you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. If we disobey, we're not abiding in His love. Are we out of the family? No. Are we in the woodshed? Yes. That's just a, such an old saying now. Okay, there's got to be something new, but I don't think parents today discipline kids, so I don't know what the contemporary idiom, idiom would be. Are you having a timeout? Somehow it just doesn't communicate, does it? <laughs> You said that you're going to have a spiritual timeout. No, it just doesn't work. See, God built these things into the whole framework. You've got to have corporal discipline. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. If we don't keep the commandments, if you're not obedient, you don't abide in His love. If you've you got to know the commandments to keep them. You've got to come to Bible class to learn them. You've got to study the Word, read the Word, know what they are, be reminded of them. It doesn't just, just happen. The overriding mandate throughout this whole section, as I pointed out, is love. Jesus gave the commandment that we are to love one another as he has loved us. That was based on the new commandment, John 13, uh, 34 and 35. John 15, 17, he repeats it again. These things I command you that you love one another. Love is marked not by feeling, not by emotion, not by feelings of warmth and rapport, but by objective standards of doing what the Word of God says to do. Now, people can get legalistic about it, and they can be doing what the Word of God says to do, and there's no relationship. See, you, you, you have to be careful not to go too far to the other extreme. But love is measured by uh, keeping the commandments. And then this leads to the production of fruit. The soul, as I said already, the soul necessary condition to produce fruit in John chapter 15 is abiding in Christ. Now we go to Galatians 5 tells us what the fruit of the Spirit is. This is the most comprehensive list, but it's not an exhaustive list. That means it gives us a lot, but it doesn't tell us everything there is to say about fruit. But what I want you to notice as we go through this study tonight is that fruit in the Bible is character. It's the virtues of the Christian life. It's not external behavior. It's not witnessing. And if you grow up in some Christian context, fruit is pretty much defined as how many people you witnessed to this week. How many people you led to the Lord. If you didn't lead five people to the Lord this week, you're just not producing any fruit. But when we go through the Scripture, that's not really how the Bible uses the term fruit in relationship to the Christian life. It's character transformation again and again and again. It has to do with, with what happens on the inside as God the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and uses it in the soul of the believer to produce the character of Jesus Christ. So we went from John 15 to Luke chapter 8 last time. We went to Luke chapter 8, and that was the parable of the soils. And just to give you just a brief review so to help you uh, get it back in your head, we have the story of the sower who comes along and he casts the seed. The seed represents the message of the, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And it, the seed lands on four different kinds of soil. What we learn from this again is that not all Christians bear fruit. Some don't bear fruit. There's growth, but there's no fruit. We saw that the seed produces a plant, uh, which, um, when, and the, when, this, when the seed falls on three types of soil, it produces some kind of growth. It's only the first soil where the path is trampled and the seed is taken by the birds and that it's not a believer. 
The other three examples, the rocky soil, we saw that the seed germinates, it grows, it generates, it sprouts, there's life, but it withers because of a lack of moisture. So there's clearly birth, beginning of life. It hears, it receives the word with joy, uh, which is the same thing said in Matthew. Believes for a while, that's not said in Matthew, but Luke makes it clear that that's what is meant by receiving the word with joy. Believes for a while, but it fails under temptation. Then we have the second kind of soil, uh, which where the seed falls on in, in, amongst the thorns. And again, it's choked out. But for the seed to be choked out, there has to be germination and some growth. And then it's choked out. Uh, this is choked out by the details of life, distractions. This represents the person who receives the message of the kingdom. But there's some growth, but not much growth. And there's no fruit production because it's choked out by the, by the, the thorns. There's too many distractions in life. And this is the, the person who never... Uh, gets very far in his spiritual growth. And then it is the last soil where we have fruit produced. Now, what makes a difference is the kind of soil. So the message is, what kind of soil are you? In other words, where, what's your volition toward the Word of God? That's what makes the difference. Now what I want to do before we go on, I keep threatening that we'll go to Ephesians 5, but finding other passages to go to. Let's go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, I just want to point out a couple of things here. You may not realize it, some of you do, because you've been around a while, but many of these passages that I'm talking about are uh, also at the heart of the debate that goes back and forth over the nature of the gospel and assurance of salvation and what is known as the debate between the free grace gospel versus lordship salvation. Lordship salvation, in essence, says that the way you know you're saved is because of the fruit that comes out in your life. And so, of course, all these passages that deal with fruit would come to play in that debate. Their argument is that if you, if, if you want to know if you're really saved, if there's been regeneration that's taken place, is it's going to produce uh, fruit in your life. And if you don't see the fruit, then you weren't truly saved. You weren't genuinely saved. You didn't have saving faith. And on the other hand, the free grace gospel says, no, we have to make a distinction between uh, justification, which happens when you believe and receive the gospel, and sanctification, which is the spiritual life. And this debate goes back a long time into history. It's taken different forms in different groups. And I think I've pointed this out before, that after the, at the time of the Reformation, beginning in 1517 and in those early early years Calvin prim- Calvin and gra- I'm not, not Calvin Luther did not grasp justification by faith alone in in all the ways he did a little later on right at first but he was he was close he was he was those those of you who go shooting uh, catch the metaphor he was on the paper he might have not been in the bullseye or in the black, but he was at least on the paper. But he had a young, sharp uh, student by the name of Philip Melanchthon, who was really the man who formulated and systematized Luther's theology. And Melanchthon had, uh, had a crisp, clear understanding of the doctrine of justification by faith alone, that at the instant of faith in Christ, we receive Christ's righteousness, God uh, imputes that righteousness to us, and on the basis of the possession of Christ's righteousness, we are declared just by God. It is not that we are just. It's not just as if I'd never sinned, which is how you'll hear some people express it. But it is that on the basis of the possession of Christ's righteousness, you are declared righteous. It's not that you're made righteous. See, there's a real important distinction because in Roman Catholic theology, there's this confusion between justification by faith and sanctification so that justification is the process of being made righteous. So in Roman Catholic theology, justification isn't a point in time, a slice of a of a nanosecond when that all of those things happen where Christ's righteousness is imputed to you, 
God the Father looks on that righteousness and declares you to be righteous because you have received uh, Christ's righteousness, justification by faith alone. So in what, what we talk uh, about, when we talk about sanctification and spiritual growth, that's what Roman Catholics mean by justification. See, they have confused that so that for them, justification is a process. How do you know if you're justified? Because you look at the, the, the morality in your life and the, the religion in your life and the good works in your life. And if that's not there, then you, you need to go get some more grace. Well, after Ca- uh, Luther and then later Calvin began to teach a tr- true, crisp, pure, unadulterated doctrine of justification by faith alone, the reaction from the Roman Catholic Church was that if, if you teach these things, that all a person has to do is trust God trust God, trust Christ to be saved, and they'll be saved and they can't lose it, then what is the uh, what is it to encourage them to be moral and to be law-abiding and to be uh, good people? Uh, you've just taken away all the motivation for that. You have to load them up with guilt. Now, when I was in Connecticut, people understood this because Connecticut had a population that was about 70% Roman Catholic, and nearly everybody at Preston City Bible Church came out of a Catholic background. If I'd say Catholic guilt, they knew exactly what I was talking about. And that's where that term comes from, is because you've got to put this load of guilt on people. Otherwise, they won't keep doing what's right. You can't control them. What ha- they're so afraid that if you tell people you're just saved by grace that they'll become licentious and just go out and do whatever they want to, however they want to, and you can't control them anymore. So, by the end of his career, and a guy named Dave Anderson, who pastors up in, uh, very good on these areas, uh, Dave's done some tremendous work on this, shows how, in an article he published in the GES Journal a few years ago, shows how in Calvin's later uh, editions of his institutes, which is what we have published today, that he goes through a change, and he begins to try to answer this objection in um, from the Roman Catholics and he starts slipping into what is now called lordship view of perseverance of the saints that if you that that if you don't show fruit you weren't really saved and that begins to develop within Calvin's thought and later it entered into reformed theology and it's been this debate that's gone on uh, down through the centuries is a person purely and simply saved by faith alone in Christ alone, and if they believe the gospel such that they they truly understand the proposition that Christ died for their sins, they understand that they can't do anything for their salvation, they understand that Christ paid it all, all they have to do is receive it as a gift, believe in Christ, accept his substitutionary death for them, and that's all they need to do to be saved, that if they live like the devil for the rest of their life, are they still saved? And if the answer to that is yes, you understand grace. But if the answer to that is no, then you're starting to muddy the water a little bit and you're confusing fruit production with germination and uh, the beginning of the plant. And that's what we're really dealing with here. And Matthew 13, uh, the parable of the soils, Matthew 13, Luke 8 are parallel passages. And that's where you get into a lot of the debate. But I wanted to come back to this and just point out something that I think that uh, we need to pay attention to. In Matthew 13, just like in Luke, you have four uh, responses to the gospel message. The parable begins in verse 3. Jesus says, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seed. Fell, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up. See, there's life, there's germination, there's some growth, a little bit, because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them, but others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So you have... You know, that's comparable to John 15, fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. You have different amounts, uh, percentages of of fruit production there. And then uh, there's a challenge, the disciples in verses 10 through 17 say, why are you talking to us in parables? 
And so Jesus is explaining that. And then he comes back to explain the parable in verse 18. Now, the thing to understand about Matthew 13 that you don't have in Luke 8 is in Matthew 13, you have a series of parables that build upon one another. There's an interconnectedness to these parables so that the symbols in one are, are, are help you understand and interpret the next parable because he doesn't interpret all of the parables for them. So you're supposed to be able to apply your your, your thought to this and put things together. So we're ju- I, the only thing I'm concerned about right now is these first two parables. So he starts to explain them, and it's the same explanation we have over in Luke 8. When anyone hears the word or the message of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one, that Satan, comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart, that this is he who received the seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Similar terminology to Luke 8. This He's a believer. He just had a little growth before uh, he doesn't have any sustenance, and he withers up and is gone. He has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Then in verse 22, Now he who receives seed among the thorns, is he who hears the word, and the cares of the world, deceitfulness of the riches choke out the word. And then we have the explanation of the fourth one. Now what I want you to note here is that on the second soil, the soil in the rocky ground, And the seed falls in the rocky ground, and it germinates. What is that seed producing? What's it producing? Is it producing the same kind of plant that is produced in verse 23 that bears fruit? Is it the same kind of plant, or is it a different kind of plant? It's the same kind of plant. The only difference between the two is the soil One's on good soil, one's on soil that's, that's rocky soil, and so it doesn't really produce any in-depth uh, root, and so it doesn't grow to maturity, but it's the same plant. Now, what we learn about this is that the plant that is being talked about here is wheat. Now, the point I'm making is that what you have in, in the parable of the soils is all related, the the three that produce some kind of growth are all wheat. You don't see the introduction of the professing or the pseudo-Christian until the next parable. And in verse 24, we read another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. See, it's the same man sowing the same good seed. The good seed is the gospel of the kingdom. He says, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. Now you're introduced to another kind of plant. This is the pseudo-Christian, the one who uh, is not a pseudo-believer. Remember, I talked about that a couple of weeks ago, and we have to keep that clear. You have people who come along and say, well, you know, there's folks who have a, a, uh, uh, a, a false faith in Jesus, or they just profess to believe in Jesus. Well, there's a difference. We have to be very careful here. There's a difference between saying you profess to believe in Jesus and you profess to be a Christian. See, if I claim, that's what profess means, is to simply make a claim. If I say I believe in Jesus, then that's a statement that unless I'm just lying, I'm telling the truth. If I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus. But if I say I'm a Christian, I may or may not be a Christian. I may be... Uh, I may I may not understand the gospel at all. I may just be part of a denomination that considers itself a Christian denomination. They may be liberal. They may hold to a, a moral influence view of the atonement. They may hold to a work salvation. They may hold to baptismal regeneration. It's just it's just a profession of being a Christian. But if I say I believe in Jesus, unless I'm just totally self deceived and I don't know what I believe. I, we have to take that to be true. They understand the gospel and they believe in Jesus. So it's not until the second parable that we have the introduction of the pseudo-Christian. Not the, I'm not going to say pseudo-believer. That, that, no category for that in the scriptures. This is the pseudo-Christian. And the only way they're identified, the tares are identified. And these are sown by the enemy. It's not sown by the man who's sowing the good seed. It's a different seed. So what we have in Matthew 
in, in the in the parable of the sower is this is all the seed of the gospel that produces all those plants. So those all have to be believers, the rocky soil, the thorny soil, and the good soil. It's not until the second parable that we have the introduction of a false, of, of a counterfeit plant into the field. Okay, so... What we've established so far is not all Christians bear fruit. Some, all you have is growth. You have a little uh, stem production, and that's about it. Those that uh, grow to maturity produce fruit at different levels. Some produce 100-fold, 60-fold, 30-fold. Matthew uh, 13 and Luke 8 both emphasize this, and I think if we're honest with the vocabulary that's used there, then the three soils all represent uh, believers. Now, let's look at another passage that talks about fruit production from a different perspective, and this is in James 1, uh, 17, and again, 121. James 1, 17, James says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from a... I got James 1, 17 in here. That is not the verse I wanted. I must have mistyped it into my computer program. So let's just turn to James and find the right verse. James 1.18. Of his own will he brought us forth by means of the word of truth. See, there is the active element at regeneration. God uses intermediate means to bring about regeneration, and it's the word of truth, the message of the gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So verse 18 is talking about regeneration. That's where the salvation comes into this discourse in, the, in this part of, of James. Then he shifts. That's the last thing he says in the introduction. Then in verse 19 and 20, he starts to make the shift to set up the rest of the book. He says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man, and my beloved brethren is a term that is used to refer to believers. He uses it many times in uh, this epistle, and he emphasized the fact that he is addressing them as as believers, as regenerate believers. He says, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. That's the outline of the book of James. You have an introduction in 1 1 through 18, and 19 down through the end of chapter 2, you have a section that expounds on the idea of what it means to be um, swift to hear. Chapter 3 deals with slow to speak and the sins of the tongue. And then starting towards the end of chapter 3, a section on mental attitude sins and on wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. And this deals with mental attitude sins summarized by the term anger or wrath here in verse 19. Conclusion, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And that's what we're after is production of the righteousness of God. This isn't righteousness for justification this isn't imputed righteousness because see he's already talking about the fact that they're saved they got justified let's clarify my terminology here they were justified in verse 18 of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that's when they're justified it's when they're regenerated that all happens at a moment in time and it all happens simultaneously regeneration justification all take place at that instant of faith alone and Christ alone. Now we're going to talk about post-salvation experiential righteousness as God is going to build maturity into the life of the believer and produce experiential righteousness, which is part of the fruit of spiritual growth. We'll see that as we go through. Therefore, he says, lay aside... uh, all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. I love the old King James superfluity of naughtiness. Just ask somebody what that means. Explain that. Meditate on that in your morning devotions. The excess which wickedness or sin is. It's a great term. It's difficult to translate in the Greek. It literally means that excess in your life which sin is. Sin is an excess 
in your life. It's not necessary. That's the same thing Paul's saying over in Romans chapter 6, is that you've been bought with a price. Or he says that in 1 Corinthians, you've been bought with a price, therefore uh, live uh, in light of your redemption. Romans chapter 6, he says you've died to sin. Therefore, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin that you may no longer live in it. Sin is superfluous now. And that's what this is going. See, I managed to use that word anyway. Sup- that's what he, it meant. The King James understood that, that it was a superfluity. It was an excess. Sin is not necessary anymore. Before you were saved, you had no choice but to sin. Everything you did came out of the sin nature. Human good came out of the sin nature. Morality came out of the sin nature. Everything came out of the sin nature. Some of the most evil people in the world today are not Mahmoud Ahmadinejad or uh, Hugo Chavez. I mean, these people are evil, but they're not anything compared to some of the folks in this country. I mean, you think about some of the folks in this country who are moral and religious. I could name you a couple of pastors who I think I'm convinced they're not saved. Boy, do they have a huge influence. They have no belief in a substitutionary atonement of Christ, no belief in sin. Uh, one of them is out in Southern California, and he believes that, that Christ died so you could have a good self-image. wrote a whole book on it called Self-Esteem, the New Reformation. And yet the, this is real evil, real evil. This is worse than any of the violent evil of the... Uh, uh, of the um, uh, Islamic terrorists. That's a different kind of evil. But I think the worst evil is the kind that comes masquerading in religion and comes masquerading in morality and comes with all kinds of wonderful uh, social programs and handouts and everything else with simply the, the veneer of, of religion or Christianity. So, God is producing righteousness in the believer. So, we're to ha- there's a precondition for this, though. And that's what's interesting about looking at um, James 1.21. Because it looks in your English Bible as if you have two imperatives there. Lay aside and receive. Right? That's what that looks like in your English. Lay aside and receive. Actually, in the Greek, you don't. You have one aorist imperative, which is receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Now, they're already justified, aren't they? Didn't we say that already? They're justified. So what's ha- when it talks about receiving the implanted word, which is able to save your souls... Is it, it's not talking about getting justified. These folks are already justified. They are my beloved brethren. Hold your place right there, and we're going to have sword drill time and turn over to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Much more than, Paul says, having now been justified... Okay, what are we right now, according to that verse, having now been justified? Just think a little bit. Having now been justified, what are we right now? We are justified. Present tense, right? Having now been justified. That now is a big, big word there, okay? Having now been justified, we shall be saved. Now, what tense do you think shall be saved is? That's future tense. See, does that mean that we can be justified and not saved? Wow. See, that doesn't fit American superficial evangelical terminology, which says that, um, which always asks the question, brother, are you saved? See, we don't use the word saved in the same way the Bible uses the word saved most of the time. Sometimes sozo is a synonym for justification but in many cases sozo is related to the post post justification life or it's related to the future glorification life and so you have to look at the context to find out and in Romans the word sozo 
to my knowledge, never refers to justification. That is not the word Paul uses to refer to getting righteousness and being able to enter into heaven. In Romans, in his vocabulary in Romans, what he's going to ask people is, are you justified? If you're justified, then we will be saved. It's future tense. So, I just want you to understand that what I'm saying here in James chapter 1 about receiving the implanted word which is able to save your souls is we're not talking about justification here. We're talking about what happens now that you are justified. You have to receive the implanted word and that'll save you. So it's an aorist command. But what's interesting in the Greek is you have something called a participle of attendant circumstance. I just love these terms. Now, you don't have a clue what that means. But what that means, and, you get, and if you go to the grammars, they'll say there's five, uh, five characteristics you look for grammatically in a sentence structure to know if you've got a, 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 a participle of attendant circumstance. And you've got them here. You've got an aorist participle that precedes an aorist imperative and a number, number of other things that are going on in the text. And what it basically means is that the heiress participle lays down the conditions that must come antecedently preceding the mandate. In other words, before you can receive the word which is able to save your soul, you have to lay aside what filthiness and the excess which sin is, Oh, does that mean that I have to quit sinning before I can get saved? Well, if that's true, then we're all lost. So we're not talking about that. What we're talking about here is just that one little word we use a lot, confession. It's confession. It's the same structure, as a matter of fact, that you have over in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter, or excuse me, chapter 2, verse 1. And 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, you have... You have the command, therefore, laying aside. It's the same word, apatithemi. It's like taking off a set of old, dirty clothes. Uh, therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, desire, there's your command. But before you can desire the sincere milk of the word and grow by it, what do you have to do? You have to go through that whole process of cleansing from sin, which comes as a result of confession, First John 1, 9. So you see all that ties together that before you can start receiving the word implanted which is able to deliver us remember those three stages of sanctification or three stages of salvation we're saved from the penalty of sin when we put our faith alone in Christ alone we're saved from the uh, power of sin during our Christian life and we're saved from the presence of sin and glorification so what did I say what happens during sanctification we're saved from the power of sin so that we don't have to we, we die to sin so we don't have to obey sin anymore that's Romans chapter 6 and so Revel, uh, so James one twenty one is saying that we have to receive the implanted word which is able to save your life basically the word here for soul uh, suke is this idiom is often used for saving your life Jesus said I came to not like the thief to kill and destroy, but to give life and to give it abundantly. How do I get that life? You get that life by being cleansed from sin and receiving the implanted word, which is able to save your life, which is able to save you from the power of sin on a day-to-day basis. And then he goes on to develop, from verse 23 on, the emphasis on hearing the word that if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, and by doer he means a plier. You come to Bible class and you hear pray without ceasing, and you go home and you don't pray for three weeks. Have you been applying the word? No. Well, to see you're a hearer and not a doer. That's what it means. Doer is in Christian service, doing his application of the word, uh, word of God. So this is where we see the production of, of fruit coming in at that point. And the implanted word, in verse 21, it is the implanted word, which is, it's that seed that grows up and produces fruit. It's that same uh, imagery that is, that's used there that buys into that whole fruit production metaphor that we find throughout Scripture. 
Now, what are some other passages that have to do with fruit production? Well, let's look at a couple of them. Hebrews 12, 11. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Now, this isn't legalism. Legalism says that by doing good, by being moral, we please God and gain his approbation. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the fact that within the context of divine discipline in the life of the believer, the believer learns to be obedient, to walk by the Spirit, and to abide in Christ, and to be filled with the Spirit. And as you take in the Word of God and let the Word of God abide in you, then it produces fruit. And part of that fruit it produces is personal evangelism, right? Right? just want to see if anybody was listening. It's righteousness. This is experiential righteousness. This isn't imputed righteousness. So it, it, and then we have other verses that back this up. For example, Colossians, Colossians 1.10 says that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. This is obviously post-salvation. To please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing In the knowledge of God. Isn't that an interesting word? Just hit me. Increasing in the knowledge of God. I wonder how many Christians there are who can say that this year they know more about God and they know God better than they did a year ago. See, that's part of growth. And it has a consequence of producing fruit in divine good. Philippians 1, 10 and 11. That you may approve the things that are excellent... See, the flip side is that is that you appro- you don't approve the things that are not excellent. I remember years ago hearing one of my seminary professors saying to us as pastors, say, men, the biggest challenge you're going to have to face as pastors is not choosing between the good and the sinful. It's going to be between choosing the good and the excellent. Don't get distracted by things that are fine and fun and good that keep you from the pursuit of the excellent in your Christian life. And so that's what Paul is saying here, that we have to approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, having been filled with the what? Fruit of righteousness again. It's experiential righteousness. It's divine good, and it is living a life that is consistent with the righteous standards of God. He sets out the protocols for living the Christian life throughout the New Testament, and that defines his standards, living consistent with those standards, the standards for the royal family of God. James 3.18, back to James, so we can come full circle. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So the gospel, again, is pictured as a seed, and as it grows and matures, as it's watered and as it's fertilized, its fruit is righteousness. Now, that sort of gives us a a framework in talking about fruit, and now let's go to another key passage on fruit. Before we can get to Galatians 5, which will tie it all together, we need to look at Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 and Galatians 5. So what we've done is we've tied John 15, Luke 8, James 1, and now Ephesians 5 and then Galatians 5. These are the critical passages. Ephesians chapter 5. Start at verse 8. Start at verse 8. Now, remember, Ephesians is, one of the, is Paul's classic, concise explanation of the church and the church age. Ephesians is a great book that one day we'll get there. But it's, it's so easy to understand because the first, first three chapters deal with doctrine. This is wh- who God is and what he has done for you in salvation. And then the last three chapters are... In light of the doctrine, this is what you do. It's, it's, it's almost like a sermon. And when we take uh, two years to get through the first three chapters, somehow we forget how the last three chapters relate because we're dealing with all this great doctrine in the first three chapters. 
but the doctrine always leads to the real practical stuff. And the practical stuff is good, and a lot of people want to jump there, but you can't understand what it means to love one another. You can't understand what it means for husbands to love your wives and wives to submit to your husbands if you don't think in the framework of the first three chapters. Because these wonderful practical commands that relate to husbands and wives and parents and children that come in the fifth fifth chapter are based on an understanding of the first three chapters. And if you don't understand that doctrinal foundation, then you end up, which is what happens in too many churches today, you end up preaching a lot of how-to sermons on how to have a good marriage, how to keep your checkbook balanced, how to raise good kids. And it's nice stuff, and it's not wrong stuff. But guess what? Because it's divorced from the doctrinal foundation, it ends up being nothing more than, a, than preaching morality. And you've destroyed the, the real... People don't understand why they're doing what they're doing anymore. They're just going out and doing moral things. And they're just, they end up trying to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps in their spiritual life. So we'll go to Ephesians 5, which is the second chapter of the application section. And he starts to explain their position, uh, remind them of their position in verse 8, so he can challenge them to their application after that. He says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. What is he talking about here? What we call positional truth, our position in Christ. Before we were, before we were justified, we were children of darkness. We were in the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of darkness. And Colossians, Paul says, now we're transferred in the kingdom of his beloved son, transferred into the kingdom of light. So when he says you were once darkness, this is what characterized you as an unbeliever. You were, you were in darkness no matter how smart you were, no matter how, how, how high your IQ was, no matter how moral you were, you were darkness. But now you are light in the, in the Lord, positionally. But then he has a command, walk, present imperative. This is to characterize your life as standard operating procedure. Walk as children of light. You are children of light. Walk as children of light. Some of you may have used this example when, um, when you were a parent, or if you are a parent, or maybe you heard it when you were a kid, and your father said, you know, you're a member of this family, and if you're going to be a member of this family, you're not going to act like that. You're going to act like this. And that's what Paul is saying here, is now you are, you are light in the Lord. You're in the member of the royal family. That means you have to live a certain way. You can't live like you did before because there's been a shift that's taken place. You've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. And so you can't live like you used to live because you're not who you used to be. You're somebody new. You are ch children of light. So walk as children of light. Now, I want you to notice the contrast. I will come back to verse 9 in just a minute, but I have to set, set you up for something. We have this, this juxtaposition between light and darkness. Absolute states. You were light. I mean, you were once darkness. Now you're light. Walk as light, not as darkness. Uh, verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but expose them. And then in verse 13, by all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. And then at the end of verse 14, Christ will give you light. And so there's a heavy emphasis all through this section on light. Now somewhere back in about the late 200s, late 3rd century A.D., a textual variant that means another word slip into the text and so in some manuscripts we find for the fruit of the light in verse 9 so I'll put it up on the board for the fruit of the light is in all goodness righteousness and truth but the major but the majority of documents the majority text it has, and the majority of documents, has spirit there. 
three of the uncials, the uncials are the um, uh, old, some of the oldest documents, three of them support one another, then the re- that the reading here should be, should be uh, light and not spirit. But one of the, what I, ca- I call them the big four, because there's four, four of the oldest manuscripts. If they all agree, then people who believe oldest is right uh, go with that. But it's a split witness. It's three against one. One of the oldies, P, uh, it's a papyri, P46, agrees with the majority text. The reading here should be spirit and not light. Now, one of the ways that textual critics look at something like this, they have this, they have various rules, and one of the rules is that you should take the harder reading. Well, it seems to me that the reading that would be harder here would be spirit because it light is used in juxtaposition to darkness all the way through. It'd be real easy to see how a, how a scribe would come along and say, well, you know, it makes more sense if that would say fruit of the light and fruit of the spirit. I'm just going to you know, write that in the margin. And then next thing you know, it's copied in. So I believe that the, uh, as you have in the King James and New King James, which is based on TR, but the TR is related to majority text, that it's fruit of the Spirit here. But in either case, they're, they're used synonymously in many places in Scriptures, so we, we shouldn't get too, too caught up one way or the other. And this production of the Spirit, which is a production of walking in the light, is defined as goodness, divine good, uh, intrinsic good, righteousness, and truth, veracity, integrity. This is what the, is produced when the believer is walking in the light. And of course, if the believer is walking in the light, he's also walking by the Spirit, and he's abiding in Christ. All these terms for walking are synonymous to one another. What we see here in Ephesians chapter 5 is this juxtaposition between two absolute conditions. You're either in the light or in darkness. You're either walking in the light or you're walking in darkness. You're either foolish or you're wise. Skip down to verse um, 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. See, you're either walking as a fool or you're walking as wise. You can't be a little bit of both. You have a tendency today from a lot of people to say, well, you can do, sometimes I'm a little bit, it's done a little bit by the Spirit and a little bit by the flesh. But I don't believe that. It's one or the other. Galatians 5.16 makes it real clear. We'll see that next time. Verse 16, a wise walk redeems the time because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk by means of wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled by means of the Spirit. It's an instrumental dative there indicating that the means of spirituality is going to be, uh, in, in the one case is wine, in the other case spirit. You'll mostly hear people talk about how uh, when you're under the influence of alcohol, it controls you. We talk about influence or control, and I think these are confusing terms. Control would indicate that you don't have any volition. Influence is a better term, but the emphasis here is on the instrumentality. In other words, you're using wine to get spiritual, and that was what was happening in Ephesus. One of the gods that they worshipped in Ephesus was Dionysius, or Bacchus. He was the god of wine. So if you wanted to really get close to the god of wine, guess what you did? You went out and drank wine till you got so drunk that the spirit of the God would enter into you and speak through you in ecstatic utterance. Gee, tongues. Wow. See how all this relates? You get a bunch of pagans coming out of a pagan Greek background, uh, hearing terminology that is similar to some of the stuff that was going on in their pagan background, and they started assimilating it instead of making radical distinctions. So what Paul is saying is, look, the way to be spiritual is not by means of wine, which is what you're doing on the weekend, going up there and dancing around with all the uh, back uh, and the, in the bacchanal with all the priestesses, but is to be filled by means of the Spirit. The Spirit is the means. It's not the content. If we were talking about content... We would be talking, you, you, Paul would use a genitive there, but he uses an a, a instrumental dative, which means something completely different. I can say, fill my coffee cup with coffee. 
and we've used the English preposition with. The content of the filling is coffee, or I can say, oh, fill up my mug with whatever is in that, uh, fill it up by, with, with that pitcher. And then the pitcher is the means of filling it. When you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you got every, all the Holy Spirit you're going to get at the instant of salvation. You don't get anymore. You're not going to get filled up with anymore. But you're either going to be filled up with something by the Spirit, or you're not. And look at the results. I got, I'll be done in one minute. We'll come back and do it next time, but I've built to this. I, I got to finish it. You're filled by means of the Spirit. What are the results? Verse 19, speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always to God, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. And then it talks about uh, wives submitting to your husbands, husbands loving your wives, fathers raising up your children. Okay, hold your place there and flip over to the parallel book, which is Colossians. Colossians 3.16, the command there is to let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. What are the results? In all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Have we heard that before? Yeah, we just heard it. It's a result of being filled by means of the Spirit. Um, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Didn't we just hear that? Yeah, we just heard that. That's the result of the filling of the Spirit. Well, wait a minute. Here, it's the result of letting the Word of Christ dwell in you. So if A produces... X behavior, and B also produces X behavior, there has to be a relationship between A and B. In other words, the filling by means of the Spirit is talking about one aspect. The letting the Word of Christ dwell in you is the other aspect. The Holy Spirit fills you with something. You are filled by means of Him, but what are you filled with? You're filled with the Word of God. So when we're in right relationship to the Holy Spirit, the dynamic, his sanctification dynamic of filling us with his word is operational. And as we abide in Christ and walk by the Spirit, it produces fruit. But when we sin and we grieve the Spirit and quench the Spirit, it stifles that ministry and there's no filling and growing. He's not taking the word and filling our lives with it. And so there's no growth and there's no fruit production. Well, that brings us up to about Galatians 5. I'll go over this again next week because it's so important. And it's so critical to understand how these passages all fit together. And then we'll wrap this side trail on fruit production up in Galatians chapter 5. Father, we thank you for this time together tonight. Pray that you'd encourage us with these things. Give us greater insight and understanding of the dynamics of the, and the means of spiritual growth. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.